Um, this is an enormous two chapters. And when I say enormous, I'm not saying that lightly. This is literally an enormous two chapters. I didn't do the math on it, although it would probably would take me a year and a half. But if you add up the two chapters together, they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 verses. We are not going to read all 100 verses because that would be insanity to try and read them, also kind of analyze them. I think there are big points that we need to make from these two chapters, so that's what we're going to look at this morning as we continue on. Um, I don't know who's supposed to lead um, the first prayer. My eyes rested on Lee. Do you mind filling in for him? Thank you, sir. Amen. Thank you, sir. John chapter 6 is not an unfamiliar chapter. Once we start talking about it, there will be certain things I'm sure you're like, oh, that's, I remember that. I just didn't realize maybe it was in this chapter. With that being said, before we take off, what is in John chapter 6? To those who studied ahead, just to those who remember it, what all happens in John chapter 6? It's kind of like a greatest hits of all the different events. Yeah. Yeah, the feeding of 5,000 is a big moment that happens in John chapter 6. What else happens in this chapter? That is probably the big moment that everyone thinks about, and we don't realize all this other stuff kind of happens in the same chapter. Jesus walks in the sea. That is another big one. Yep. That, of course, goes along with, if I remember right, uh, Peter sinking in the sea. I don't know if those are the two events. I think there might be another event that that happens as well. My memory's a little fuzzy on that. What else happens in John chapter 6? Lee? Yeah, there's, that's one of the big things that kind of happens in John chapter 6. It's buried into a bigger discussion that he just has with the Jews in general. But yeah, he talks about his death, burial, and resurrection. He talks about his ascension, which is kind of cloaked in this whole long discussion about how I'm the bread of life, I'm the man that's sent down from heaven. And as you mentioned there at the end, a lot of people don't realize that that's what he's talking about. So there's a lot of things that he touches on here in chapter 6 that just kind of fly right over their heads. Honestly, if I were sitting there listening to it, probably I wouldn't understand what's going on either. So there's a lot of things that happens here in John chapter 6 that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. And that's why I think it's important to kind of look, zoom out and look at it from a big view. Chapter 6 is all about kind of these three major events. The first one, as we mentioned earlier, is the feeding of the 5,000. This is the moment when everybody looked at Jesus and said to themselves, this guy is obviously somebody special. I told you there was an 8% chance of this thing making it through with Bible class. There's this guy is somebody special. This is a very obvious event where things happen. When you look also at, eventually this will pop back up. When you look at John chapter 6, verse 15 through 25, this is the moment where Jesus walks in the water. We won't really touch on that that much. When you look at verses 26 through 71, this is his massive discourse with the Jews. And John, I like how he kind of goes into this. It's up there now. John kind of goes into this whole section and really breaks down every single nugget of it. What I think you'll be interested in noticing if you read all of chapter 6 kind of cover to cover is the transition of their attitude towards Jesus throughout the course of this chapter. What is the crowd's attitude at the beginning of John chapter 6? You just witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. What is your attitude about Jesus? <clears throat> well, you really like him. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, you're impressed because he gave you lunch. I mean, and he did it in a miraculous way. So, yeah, there is that. Go ahead. Yeah, this is this could really go one of I can always tell when the screen is flickering because everyone looks up automatically. So I can tell when it's when it's bailing out on me. It is, it is kind of a moment where the transition of who Jesus is could go one of either way. Either he could have, and I'm not saying he would have or even had the inclination, but he could have taken this moment and ran with it, become king of the Jews. He could have become, you know, led them onto this kind of crusade. That's not his intention as is clear from the discourse in verses 26 through 71, and it kind of goes a different direction, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Right.
And you would have, you would have fixed my computer too? Yeah, that was, seems like a little bit of a cheap shot, but I'm okay with it. Yeah, I, that's probably what all of us would have liked to think that we have done. I mean, I still kind of wonder how much of this was obvious to everybody. Jesus references the feeding of the 5,000 a couple of times later. I, I can't remember in what context he does, but he talks, or he talks about the disciples. He said, when I fed you all, did anybody kind of really guess where the bread came from? There is some question in the a sea of 5,000 people how much they all knew about it. That being said, it seems like the disciples kind of took a little bit of a straw poll because it does mention earlier in that chapter that all they had was, I think, something around the neighborhood of 200 denarii, which when you factor all that out and you put it in modern-day context, you're looking at close to 10 grand. So unless there's just somebody that has a uniquely deep wallet on them for whatever reason traveling out throughout Judea, it's most likely they took kind of a poll to see what everybody had. Everybody kind of knew they didn't have much, and so all of a sudden to feed 5,000 people, you're going to need a pretty robust wagon train. I mean, even if you're feeding an army of 5,000 people, the wagon train is pretty elaborate. So I think they probably had some inclination of what would happening. You would like to think that if I were there, I probably would have believed in the same way. Whether or not I would have is kind of left up to my imagination. Verses 15 through 25, if you're witnessing that, obviously there's no question who this guy is. That's, I think, the big thing, but that happens more or less in private. When you look at verses 22 through 25, it kind of talks about the mood of these people. Look here in Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 22. It says, the next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they had the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats, then came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? What is the attitude of these people at this point? In verses 22 through 25. What is, their, what is their attitude towards Jesus in verses 22 through 25? They're certainly amazed that he got on the other side of the, mo- the ocean without them seeing him. I think there's that for sure. There's a little bit of a state of confusion. Yeah. That's, I think, a little bit closer to where I'm at. They were still following him because they were feeding him. I think it kind of shows, in my opinion, the lost puppy attitude. You know, where did this guy go? He just fed us lunch, and now he's over here. So there's the confusion aspect. But there's also, I think, emblematic of a statement that's referenced several times in the Gospels, which is they were looking for him as sheep that had no shepherd. I mean, more or less, without Jesus, they were kind of lost. And I think you see that in those three verses. Lee? Yeah, I, that's, to me, that is kind of the attitude that you look at when you get there. When you look at chapter 7, though, it's after this long discourse of verses 26 through 71, then you have the response chapter. Chapter 7, this should be actually be, um, I'm sorry, this is the responses throughout John chapter 6. When you have John chapter 6 and verse 2, large crowds follow him. You have that whole thing happening there. Verse 24, then you have the crowds going to Capernaum. By the time you get to the end of the chapter, Everybody leaves, and that's what I think is an interesting progression throughout this chapter. That's why I think chapter 6 is such a microcosm, of you, if you will, of the people's attitude towards Jesus. Because when he does miracles, everyone is really for him. They all believe in him, they all love him, they all care about him. But when he starts speaking hard things, what happens in that moment? You can make the argument that that's not what they were there for, but I think they were probably with him most of the way. I mean, there were several things that Jesus said before this point that they probably listened to and had no issue with. Why does it get hard? Or why do sometimes, or let me ask you this question. What makes it get so hard that you would want to turn away after seeing what they saw? Yeah, they were, they were comfortable with him feeding him. As long as, and you can make a lot of modern-day parallels with this, as long as the person is feeding them, then there's no real issue there. As, but until you start making things that are difficult to comprehend, asking people to take action in their lives, and I think more than anything else, kind of a state of confusion, you don't really know what's going on or where this comes from. You just decide it's easier to just walk away. And it's not necessarily out of hatred. It's not necessarily out of antagonism. It is obviously with some people. But it's just, I don't really know what to do with this. And so I'm just going to go over here for a little while, and I'm going to figure that out. That's essentially what happened with Peter whenever Jesus was crucified. I don't know this guy. I don't know anything about him. I'm going to go over here while I kind of observe from afar. Lee? 
Right, and to be fair, a lot of the things that Jesus says in John chapter 6 would force anybody out of their comfort zone. If I heard just some random person, if Levi just started talking, which he is just a random person, obviously, but if I just heard somebody like Levi talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, laying down your cross and following me, and I am Moses, or you know, all these different things, there would be a lot of confusion. And I don't really know how I would take something like that. I may think differently because it is Levi, but if it was just some random guy, maybe not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Making the transition from a physical to a spiritual. Yeah. And that's what they can't comprehend. You know, right. Something can't comprehend and something I want to I don't really, and here's, I guess, where I fall down on that, too. I'm not really making the argument, although I know that's not what you're claiming. I'm not really making the argument that they needed to comprehend everything right now. I just think they w- I wish that they would have given them a little bit more time. Given what they saw, the guy is obviously, I don't mean the guy flippantly, he is obviously not crazy. He's not a deceiver. So there, if you witness something like this and everything else that they saw, there has to be something a little bit more to it than just he's insane. And I think that's where they kind of fell off because it was just easier. As I mentioned earlier, chapter 7 is a response chapter. When you look at chapter 6 and verse 14, you kind of see this breakdown. It mentions there in chapter 6, verse 14, when they saw the signs, they said, truly, this is the prophet that came into the world. When you fast forward into John chapter 7, verses 40 through 41, then it gets a little confusing. When they heard these words, and this is why chapter 6 and 7 go together, when they hear these words in verses 40 through 41, they say this certainly is the prophet. Some people are adamant that this is a prophet. Others are saying this is the Christ, and yet others are saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Why does, what causes some of the, <laughs> to use one guy in those several words, what causes the consternation within these individuals? In the words of them, this isn't just the old time boy or old town boy that we saw over there, the carpenter's son. That's that's not where the Messiah is going to come. Yeah. They do at least a little bit understand where he's going to come from, or at least at the very least where he's not going to come from. He's not going to come from Galilee because that would just be crazy talk. Why would he come from there? There's nothing there. What causes this consternation? Right, and I, to me, I think this represents the central issue when, it look, when you look at what's happening here. They have this preconceived notion, they match that up with what they see, and then they confuse, or they put that up against what they hear, and none of it seems to fit. If you wake up and you have your, you know, I'm not going to get into some kind of elaborate example, but if you wake up in the morning and you think, okay, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is what I think about the world, and then a whole bunch of things that you see and you hear kind of challenge that belief, you're going to be reluctant to embrace it on Monday. Maybe Tuesday's a little easier, maybe Wednesday, Thursday, but it's going to cause some friction. And I think you look at this, if you look in John chapter 7 and verse 19, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but when you look at verses 19 and 20 of John chapter 7, it says, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law. Then why do you seek me? The crowd answers in the only way that somebody who is threatened can answer, which is with an accusation. You have a demon who seeks to kill you. Jesus answered verse 21 and said to them, I did one deed and you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well at the feast or on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge according to righteous judgment. What is the Jews' fundamental flaw with Jesus, at least that they found? You can find 10 different answers for this. Right. There's a, there's a huge issue when it comes to what they perceived about Jesus in terms of he's not going to come from Galilee. There's no way the Messiah is going to come from Galilee. With what he's teaching, there's no way that the Messiah would, would heal on the Sabbath because, after all, the law says that you should work on the Sabbath. But then you match that up against what he does in chapter 6 and then walking on the water, and the two just don't seem to fit. Because, as Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, nobody can do these signs that you do unless what? 
unless God is with you. So there's a huge issue with confusion here, matching what you know versus what you see, and none of it seems to make sense. In that moment, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, what do you need more than anything? Let's say you set out at the beginning of this day, I'm going to follow Jesus, and then all this stuff just kind of hits you. What do you need to have if you're going to keep following Jesus? An open mind. Exactly. What all is involved in having an open mind? Right. You have to be willing to put your own opinions about things to the side, your own prejudices to the side, and just accept what you see. Yeah. Yeah. Right, nobody's, and Jesus isn't asking these people to be gullible. And that's one thing I think you notice when you look at the entirety of John is Jesus never says, I want you to go from A to Z. He kind of logically takes you through the different sections and says, stay with me here, stay with me here, stay with me here. The people that refuse to do that are the ones that leave. And that's kind of what you see here in John chapter 6. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? Yeah, Ray. I agree with that to a certain extent. It's very easy to armchair quarterback this conversation 2,000 years later and say, what a bunch of buffoons, what a bunch of hypocrites. I can't believe they didn't get it. Because you're right, we do do operate from a distance. But at the same time, I'm not seeing Jesus feed the 5,000. So to say that me living now is easier than them living there, I think is a false equivalency. Because if I saw that, like you just mentioned literally 15 minutes ago, you would think that I would say, well, of course this makes perfect sense to me. I think the other issue that I have, and not with you necessarily, at least not at this moment, the other issue I have with what you said is that almost seems to indicate that people today don't operate the same way. I mean, somebody would look at us 2,000 years from now and say, well, the people that believed in Jesus at that point were very simple. You know, blue-collar workers, they went to their jobs, they came home. Well, that's true to a certain extent, but we still also have our own opinions and our own prejudices that we deal with. And, And the same token, a lot of people are willing to come to Jesus until things get hard. Or until, and probably most pertinent to what we're talking about, things get confusing. And then at that point, it's easier to just kind of step away than it is to actually dive into the text and see what he says about things. And that's, that's the fundamental problem with people in this section. But I agree with what you said kind of as a whole. Yeah. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Oh. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're just not going to they're just not going to handle that. And to be fair, the same people said the same thing whenever the prophets came in the Old Testament, whenever God speaks to them, they didn't understand what he was saying. So they kind of just ignored it completely and moved on with their lives. So I I think you're exactly right. Whenever we're, we're cool to accept Jesus to a certain point, but whenever things get difficult, we tend to just kind of ignore it in hopes that something easier will come along. Yeah, that's true. Lee? Mm-hmm. Uh, by the religious group or religious world back then, 
Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and to Ray's point earlier when he was talking about the difference between us and them, that is a huge difference between us and them. As we mentioned, I think, last week, they don't have a copy of the Torah sitting on every kitchen table. I mean, they also wouldn't have known how to read it. Most of them wouldn't have at that point in time. So they predominantly look to their religious teachers as being the source of that inspiration. And for the religious teachers to go against Jesus, that's going to cause some problems with you too. So I think that's, I think that's certainly a big part of it as well. Uh, Ken and then uh, Karen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You can. Yeah, I think you can argue that they're just flippant. That they're very flimsy in regards to the relationship with God. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. Karen. Right. Mm-hmm. Because television and degrees obviously give people an air of credibility. I mean, obviously. And, that, and I, may, I don't mean to make light of it, but you're exactly right. We instinctively, when we see somebody on TV or when we see somebody with a degree, we think to ourselves, well, obviously that guy knows more. I mean, we all do that. And the reality is, is that doesn't really give them any more credibility than anybody else. To, I mean, it does to a certain extent. But the same conundrum that you're addressing is exactly right in regards to our life is we all have the responsibility to look into it. The problem becomes when we look into it, we see something here that disagrees with what person X told me that is on TV or has a degree. We think, well, I'm not going to make a drastic life change based on what I read because my own perception of it is really the only guiding point in that. Even though it may be in black and white and red, on my, own, my own interpretation or my understanding of the scripture could be flawed because it disagrees with this guy who spends his entire life doing it. And if it disagrees with them, I'm not going to make a huge life change because I don't trust myself. And I think when you float back to John chapter 3, that's a lot of why Nicodemus is there. I mean, I see what I'm seeing. I hear what I'm hearing. and I know what I know. But there's a disconnect there. And I need to explore this a little bit deeper on my own, on my own time. And I need to go through the entirety of John to signal that kind of growth that you see in Nicodemus throughout the book. So there's a lot of things happening here. And I, I didn't mean to spend this much time on it. But I do think it is important to kind of grasp all these concepts when we look into this. When you look at John chapter 6, there's other things that hap- that's happening here as well. This is a distinctly Jewish audience that Jesus is addressing. And so there are things that happen, there are things that are said that call back to what the Israelites would have understood. For instance, John chapter 6 and verse 4 states that this happens during the Passover. That's no question about what that symbolizes these people. So this happens at a very distinctly religious time for them. He also, like, bread, or like the Passover, uses bread, chapter 6 and verse 11. So there's that connotation to it as well. He gathers up 12 baskets, which, of course, symbolizes what? He's, yeah, the 12 tribes of Israel. You can make the New Testament analogy with the, um, with the, uh, the apostles. You also have the statement um, by the masses here in John chapter 6 and verse 14. If you look at what is said about Jesus, it says, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So there's a religious understanding about that as well, once this reappears. Don't worry, Nathan, I've got the PC for your song service, in case I know you're sitting there sweating it out. Um, When you look at John chapter 6 and verses 15 through 25, he walks across the sea, which of course symbolizes what? Right, the parting of the Red Sea, or at least the journey across the Red Sea. There's some kind of transformation that happens. You also have a direct reference to Moses there in John chapter 6 and verse 32. And then the application to them in verses 48 through 50. Look at what's said in these verses. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and he died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. 
So the connotation there is you, your ancestors ate physical bread. In order to live forever, you have to eat what? Spiritual bread, exactly. So there's all these kind of allusions when you look from the New Testament to the Old Testament. I think they're obviously picking up on this. Somebody have any thoughts or comments before we dive into this text? Yeah, Dan. Right. Right. That's true. I mean, I I think to your point, there's one of part of the many mastery moments. I don't know how you say that. Part of what makes Jesus such a master of teaching is that he utilizes things that are nearby to illustrate his point. So to your point, John chapter 4, they're sitting by the well. Jesus says, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. He makes the exact same argument in John chapter 6, except he relates it to bread. Why is that? Because he just fed 5,000 of them. So he is a master of the moment in taking things that are nearby and appropriating them to his own purposes to teach spiritual truths. But you're right. It almost seems like when the analogy shifts, sometimes they're like, hold up, hold up. We're cool with water, not so much with bread. Jesus is going to cycle back to water, I think, later in John chapter 11 when he talks about how he is, um, he is the water that springs forth to life eternal. That may be in another chapter, but he kind of mixes analogies and says much the same type of thing. That is surprising. I mean, when you look at John 4 and the woman goes back into the town and everybody comes out, it does seem like they're by and, by and large more accepting of Jesus. The counterpoint to that would be this seems to be one of the only moments where the masses weren't accepting of Jesus. Most, from most of the story, they're right there with him in lockstep, following him from town to town. So it could be a, a Samaritan Jew kind of difference. I think probably a lot of it just boils down to what he talked about because not only is he talking to the masses here, as we'll find out here in a second, he's also talking to the religious leaders too. So that plays into that. Who doesn't? I mean... I I think there's probably quite a bit of groupthink that's happening here. I mean... (laughs) I try to put myself in the shoes of somebody that's actually in that moment half the time. And if I'm sitting there next to Bill, and there's 5,000 of us, and the guy is saying, um, Jesus is saying, rather, he's saying that I am the bread of life. I'm going to listen to that and think to myself, okay, that, maybe he's using an analogy. And then Bill next to me says, I can't believe he says we need to eat his face. And you're like, yeah, I can't, what a crazy thing that is. And then before you know, disperse, and you don't really intend to leave Jesus... You just kind of think to yourself, well, that was a fun three weeks spent with this rabbi in the middle of the wilderness. I'm going to go on about my life. So I, I think there's quite a bit of groupthink that takes place. That's my own personal opinion. Yeah, Joe? Don't you also imagine that as things picking up his followers, the Pharisees, oh, they hate him. Because I can't remember where in the chronology chapter 6 falls into, but I know by the time you get to chapter 12, He's, he's set his face directly to go towards Jerusalem. Chapter 11, he's close to there because the Pharisees come out to meet him. The Pharisees never left Jerusalem unless it was for a specific reason, which is part of why Jesus spent the majority of his time up in Galilee. So I think the Pharisees are starting to hear more and more about the masses, um, and I think they're hearing a lot about who he is and certainly starting to get jealous for sure. When you look at this section, John chapter 6, at large, there are three distinct moments. And in the first moment, verses 26 down through verse 40, he speaks directly to the crowds. We will not take the time. No, we will take the time. We've got the time. Look in verse 26. He says, He answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, and not, or be, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So that is one section of that. And I I would argue this is probably the key moment of this entire message to at least the crowds in these 15 verses. What does Jesus say to these people in verses 26 through 29? 
And this is how he sets up the whole discussion about eating my flesh. It doesn't just begin with that. Right. And so, and people in years, decades past, used to make a big deal about this, and I think there's some truth to this. People that say that you can't be saved by, you can't be saved by works. Well, faith itself is described as a work here in John chapter 6 and verse 29. So you can make that argument very plain. I don't know if that's exactly how he's using it, but it, it does say it in this passage. But the point that he's saying here in verses 26 through 29 is what? If you want to live forever, don't go after things that perish. Go after what? Go after spiritual things. There's not, I mean, it's not any deeper than that at this point. They have the logical response, which is, what shall we do that we work the works of God? That's a very ironic question because these are Jews. These are people who should have done nothing else except know what the works of God are. So the fact that they're asking Jesus shows that they're at least open at this point to different things. Jesus answered and said to them, verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may believe or that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? That is ridiculous because what does Jesus say in verse 26? The whole reason you're following me is because of what? The whole reason you're here is because you saw the signs. So why in verse 31 are they asking for a sign that they may believe in him? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's 3 o'clock and they're ready for their snack. Yeah. Going to pull Cheez-Its out of the sky this time. Right. When they say this, and this is, I think, a common misconception, they're not looking for part two of the feeding of the 5,000. They're looking for something that signals who he is. Fireworks. <laughs> yeah, fireworks, or I don't know why the, um, well, never mind. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to get dismissive with any of this, but you're right. They're looking for some kind of grand scene of display that Jesus pronounces himself. That's not an unfamiliar concept to these people. Verse 31, you have a little bit of what they're looking for. So, John, go ahead. In some way, I, I mean, so if you think about what signs Jesus did to some people, especially in private, those are monumental works. For instance, the, when Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, that signals something. Later in John chapter 8, whenever Jesus asks God to glorify his name and God glorifies it, when, he, when the transfiguration takes place, those are signal moments that don't just happen. They're not, they're not oh, I fed you. They are, these trumpet who I am. And it comes from God himself. So my opinion is, is that that's what they were looking for. At this point, it's just the crowd. I think you meant or see that, uh, yeah, verse 24 down through verse 26. It's Steph Probably, I mean, probably a lot of them because he mentions there in verse 26 that you saw the signs. These are people that, if they're willing to follow him to the other side of this lake, they probably have been with him for some time up to this point. But don't forget, too, that the, I mean, these people are well-versed in Egyptian history with Moses. So two of those signs, if my memory serves right, the sorcerers were able to duplicate. So maybe they're not as convinced at this point. And that might be the difference between the manna from heaven that's talked about there in verse 31, which is that came from the sky. Like, there's no place for that to come from except from God. We are maybe not sure about this. Maybe they're sons, but they don't really, I, I don't know what their mind is, but they're at least asking for more authentication. I know that didn't answer your question, but that did it satisfy a little bit. I think they probably would have seen more than we give them credit for. Um, but it's kind of like if you think about Gideon, for instance. Gideon didn't want to just see one miracle. He wanted to see two. And he asked for authentication a second time, I mean, before he went and fought the Midianites. So it's not uncommon for people to ask to be double sure about things. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, when you look at verse 31, it was, it's kind of clear a little bit more what they're looking for. 
Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness that is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So their mindset is, this bread came from heaven, and where, what do you do to prove that you came from God? Because the bread that you just gave us came from this little kid's basket. So what do we know about this? And, and maybe that's where they're coming from. You're right, it is easy, once again, to armchair quarterback it. That's why I want to try to get into the mindset of these people. Paul? Right. 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 Which I think begs an interesting question if you want to ask it at this point, and maybe this kind of helps that, that discussion a bit further. Why is it that Jesus didn't do something like that, that at this moment? Because he's not a stranger to doing these big moments. Why is it at this moment that he said, I'm just not going to do that? I'm not going to be your little sideshow. Right. Right. I think he could have. I mean, you, he, he's at this point, he, that perception is there that they're looking for a king, but he's up in Galilee. I don't know if that's what they're looking for right now. I think that they're going to be looking for that. But I think what you see in chapter 6 is you've got all this information. Now there needs to be a decision. This is when the stuff gets real. So I'm going to tell you what I am, and you need to do something with it. I, that, to me, I think is what's happening here. So I don't know if the kingship idea is here, but I can see that. Well, it's a different. It's the same group, different time period. A different. It's not. They're not as far down the road. I would argue, but I may be off, off on that. Ken. Right. Right. So, to my question a second ago, why not do another sign to triple authenticate it? I mean, I, I think that's a fair question. Right. At some point, you can't just keep asking Jesus to do miracles for you. At some point, you just have to you have to make a decision based on what you see. And our, all of us are have that at some point. Karen. Right. Well, most of them were disobedient, yeah. Right. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, to your point, I mean, the, the time period from Mount Sinai to Canaan in, in Exodus, round one, was two months. And so you're two months removed from thunder and lightning, you know, the golden calf, everyone's drinking the gold dust. Um, literally, they're literally drinking the gold dust. These are people that came firsthand witnesses to the Egyptian Exodus. I mean, these are people that knew what God was all about. By the time you get to Canaan, two out of the ten spies have any guts at all to say, hey, we can go take this place. So it is a, this whole thing is a commentary on the, the whimsical nature of humanity that we don't, really, we don't really care what you did. We want to know what you're going to do. And maybe that's a little bit of this too. Let's look at what he says though because we've got to kind of move through this now. In verse 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. In other words, the source was not Moses, it was God. That's the connection that you need to make people to them. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They then said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus makes, in my opinion, the most foundational argument in the entire chapter when he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. There's all this discussion about water and about food and about eating and about eternal life and the works of God. 
it all finds its center point inside of me. And so if you're going to go anywhere, it has to be with me. It can't be with anybody else. And that's what we talked about several times throughout this quarter is that Jesus reiterates over and over and over again that if you're going to do anything in regards to God, it has to be through him. He makes no bones about that. He never backs down from it. He keeps reiterating it over and over again to force their hand. And I think that's a very compelling statement to make. Anybody have any thoughts or comments on this? Curtis? Right. 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 And by doing that, what you just talked about, by saying Moses did this, what do you do? By doing that, what they're doing is equating Jesus with Moses. And Jesus' argument, and as he, as he mentions in verses 20 or 31 through 33, is, is that bread didn't come from Moses. That bread came from God. I am God. And so if you want to if you want to have a discussion about where that came from or what I am, it's totally different than who Moses is. There are some corollaries and there's some parallels. But I'm not Moses. I'm not Moses 2.0. I'm not just the prophet that exists on earth. I am the prophet that comes to die for your sins and teach you the way of God. I am God. And so he continually ramps that up throughout this chapter. And so if you look at what he says, you know, if, we don't have the time to read it now, but if you look at verses 36 down through verse 40, he talks about his mission coming directly from God. This is who I am. This is what I'm sent. This is the authority that I possess. And then he turns directly to the Jews in verses 41. Um, they complain in verse 41 because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Why is it that they have an issue with what he said there? Why, does, why is that the sticking point? can't believe he would say that. Exactly. Verse 42 answers that question. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I've come down out of heaven? He didn't come down out of heaven. He came from Joseph and Mary from Nazareth. We know that. The ironic part of that is, I guess the virgin birth wasn't really a hot commodity at that point. And so the suspicion about Mary was, was, or the suspicion about Mary probably wasn't, I guess, as popular as we would think. Maybe it wasn't, you know, as common. But they thought Joseph and Mary are the ones that created him. And so how can he say he came down of heaven? He didn't descend from that. Verse 44, Jesus kind of draws on that analogy by saying, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So there's, once again, this idea of, of intent there's this idea of deliberation the fact that everything centers around who god is verse 51 he says i am the living bread that came down out of heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever and the bread also which i give for the life of the world is my flesh what is he alluding to in verse 51 the flesh that i have is what i give to the world it's death on the cross exactly so when he says you need to eat of my flesh and drink my blood, is it an analogy or an illustration of the Lord's Supper? I think so. But he's also more intently talking about you need to take part in this crucifixion, which lays the groundwork for everything he eventually says, which is lay down, your, lay down yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. I mean, it kind of provides that kinsmanship. Verse 57 and 58, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. How difficult is that, those two verses? If you took everything else out of this, and you just focused on John 6, 57, 58, how difficult would those two verses be? It's impossible, and yet we're doing it right now. But, yes. Right, it was totally impossible to them because, and no pun intended, this is something they needed to chew on. They need to take what Jesus said in regards to the prophecy concerning his crucifixion, the prophecy about, or the prophecy about the prophet, what happened, all these different things, his statements, and really meditate on it. They didn't do that because in verse 50 or in verse 59 and 60 it says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to this? There are two questions that are asked here in this last part of John chapter six. The first one is, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? In response to that, they all leave. Jesus then turns to his disciples and says, are you going to go? And in verse, I think it is in verse, uh, yeah, 67, 
or verse 66 and 67, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. So the question from the Jews towards Jesus is, this is a really difficult statement. Who can listen to this? Peter's statement, when is asked, he's asked about his intentions, is what? See, Peter, Peter bridges the gap. Peter gets involved in later on in the gospel. Some of which is well-deserved. Because yeah. Right. But this is one, this is one case where he gets it. Yeah. He's been saying because the whole point about Jesus being, you know, you can eat my flesh and blood. It's he consumed me. Well, what is Jesus? Jesus is the word. He mm-hmm. consumed the word and be filled on a spiritual level. Right. And Peter gets that and says, "You have the word of eternal life." Right. The word that leads to eternal life. Yeah, and that to me represents the mindset that all of us should have. When you look at the disposition of, of the masses versus Peter, if you're going to boil it down to those two, not you, but if we're going to boil it down to those two, then you have the masses who say, well, this is a difficult statement. I don't get it. I'm going to leave. Peter, on the other hand, says the exact same thing. This is a difficult statement, but there's nowhere else to go. And I think that's the difference between these two groups of people. And not that Peter was like, oh, you know, I have all this understanding about the flesh and the blood. And I, I get it. Peter didn't know a tenth of what he would eventually come to know. But the difference between him at this point and everybody else, and probably the rest of the apostles inside with Peter, is he at least said there's no other option. Guys, we just saw what he did. And if, if he is not the Messiah, even though I don't get it now, it's not like I'm going to find somebody else who's easier to swallow and yet provides the same salvation. It, 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 there's no other recourse. And that's what I think Peter does really well is Peter reacts in a lot of ways with what he believes to his core. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's wrong. But he always, and this is going to sound really 21st century, he is really, I don't even want to say it, he's living his truth. Here come the groans. He's somebody who at least is honest with himself about what he sees. Most of the people were willing to give up on what Jesus promised because they didn't get it in that moment. Jesus says, there's no other option here. We have to accept it. I don't know how long it's going to take for me to get it. It may take the rest of my life, but I'm at least going to try because there's no other option. Lee, did you have something? Right. Right. They had the basics and they understood and what the Day of Atonement and the other feasts were designed to do was to reiterate the, the dependency on God. And yet those feast days that they did in functionality, they never really got the point of it, which was to continue to remind them of their dependence on God. And I think that's a great point. Jesus talks to his disciples in verses 59 through 65. We're obviously going to take the time to read all of John chapter 7. There are a lot of comments that are made in John chapter 7 that are, in my opinion, a direct response to what happens in John chapter 6. If you look, for instance, in verses 10 through 13, it is all about confusion. They have no clue what's going on. They have no idea where he is. And the statements that are mentioned in John chapter 7 reflect this hesitancy towards Jesus. For starters, verse 15, how can this man become learned having never been educated? That is, to me, emblematic of the society. There's no way that somebody can become smart because they never went to school. Well, we wouldn't say that today. They did then. They also have statements like, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Is this not the man whom they're seeking to kill? I like how those kind of work in tandem with each other. The rulers don't know what this is the Christ. Are they aware of what he's doing? When the Christ comes, will he perform these same signs? Where does this man intend to go? There are all sorts of questions in in chapter 7 that are in response to chapter 6 that we'll pick up on, I guess, a little bit more next week. Um, If you have comments or questions, we'll keep those for next week as well. Thank you, everybody.